when it comes to growing your startup, uh, raising funds is really so important. You need, you need funding to go full time, to hire people, to scale, to manufacture hardware, to have to approval. So we're really, really so lucky to have uh, to learn about, to have an opportunity to learn about startup financing from Hank Ferry. Hank is the former CEO of Napster. He's also a uh, Managing Director of Homer Woodland Venture Partners. He's currently co-chair at Sydney Austin's uh, Emerging Companies and Venture Capital Practice Group. And he had over 20 years of experience in uh, funding early stage companies. Um, it's, I really want to thank Hank for being here today and it's such an honor. Please welcome Hank Barry. Um, I want to thank Susan, Phyllis Monster, who is a family member who just sold his company to you today. There you go, Susan. Excellent. Oh, um, excuse me. And, um, and also, Wendy. Where's Wendy? Thank you, Wendy. You've been very patient. Um, so, this is who I am. HBerry at Sidley.com is my regular email. And please feel free to email me with. Uh, really any kind of questions that you want, things that don't get answered tonight, um, any sort of uh, uh, you know legal issues that you might have. I can't sort of give you legal advice without uh, figuring out some way to have a client relationship with you, but um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk about anything that affects uh, startups from the perspective of, of my uh, years and years and years and years of experience uh, in this area. I went to Michigan undergrad and then Stanford, started practicing law in New York at an entertainment uh, law firm, and, uh, but I was, the, I was the guy at the Stanford Law Review who took law review from a paper-based system to a computer-based system. I personally bought three Lisa computers to do that for ten thousand dollars a piece. Uh, so that was interesting. When I got to New York, I found that I really missed the valley, so I came back here and uh, started in law practice. You know, working with a law firm called Wilson Sunset, great firm. Was a partner there until 1999, and then went over and became an investor at Hummer Wimblad. Very soon after when I started at Hummer, um, the firm decided to make this investment in Napster, and my partner said, you know, Hank. Uh, there's, the board is kind of fractionalized here and things are in a little bit of a state of disarray. Uh, why don't you go in and be the CEO just for a couple of weeks until we get somebody to come in? And I said, sure. And I was there for two years. And then we had three years of litigation after that. So, um, really interesting turn in my life. I wouldn't change any of it for a minute. But uh, wow, what a, what a thing that was. Uh, then ended up. Uh, going back to Hummer, managing that litigation. And, and in the course of that, I got to be friends with the people at Amazon. And they were in the process at that point of starting a music service. And it turned out that they uh, needed some lawyering for that. So I got involved with them in that. And uh, in 2009, I started uh, with two other people, the Palo Alto office of Sidley Austin. Now, Sidley Austin is a big, I have a 1700 lawyer law firm, fourth biggest in the world or something, nine offices in Asia, six in Europe, etc. But I really like it. They've been around since uh, the 1850s. One of their first clients was uh, the predecessor to AT&T, the Alexander Graham Bell Company. So very early stage um, startup company before it became AT&T. And to this day, we still uh, represent AT&T. So the company, this law firm has known technology and growing technology companies um, uh, for a very long time. We started out with three people. We're up to 40 now, so we're a little startup. We're kind of chugging along, trying to get more clients, and uh, doing all the things that startups do, recruiting, et cetera, trying to find money here and there. And uh, so far, it's going, it's going pretty well. That's my background. And anything that you guys want to know uh, that has to do with any of those things, I'm happy to talk about. Um, and really, if people, does anybody have any topics like right off the bat they want to hear about? Like, so I'll know what people want to know. Yes. Strategic partnering. What time? Strategic partnering. Strategic partnering, okay. Yeah. Sharing the economy. 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 Sharing the economy.
So, um, amazingly enough, somebody asked about the thing I prepared. Yeah. So, I was hoping, and we didn't meet before me or anything. No. Good, that's cool. Good. So, I, I'm going to get to all those things, and I'll talk about Napster and sharing economy and, and uh, all kinds of uh, things that people want to know about, uh, particularly with respect to negotiations, because you can negotiate terms and financings. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the news, sort of the news of the day. The news of the day is, I think, pretty revolutionary, and it's something that you should um, sort of know about. Let me give you a little bit of background. We have a thing in the United States called the Securities Act of 1933, and that was put in the Depression, so people couldn't sell stock down in the corner to people who were just coming by saying, you want to buy this stock, right? And, and that makes a lot of sense, but one of the fundamental premises of the Securities Act is you can't go out and generally solicit people. That is to say, advertise. You can't go talk to people on the street corner about an offering of stock that you have. Okay? That's just fundamental. If you're going to make any kind of a public offering, you have to do it in the way that the Act says you have to. And that means you have to file an S-1. You have to go through all of the normal things that people go through in order to uh, have what we call a public company. So the great advantage of a public company is, of course, you can generally solicit. You can sell to the public company. Everything okay? Okay, announcement. Yes, a general announcement. If you are driving a Wave Honda Accord, the top eight different models, please register your parking near the railroad. Can you shift your car? Because it might get hit. Yes. Great Honda. That's not me. Thank you. Thank you. So, essentially, this structure uh, has been around for a very long time, 80 years at least. And um, what happened within the last couple of years is the um, We saw the number of IPOs go down dramatically in the decade following the bust, right? So we had this big boom in the 1990s, the, the 2000s were really bad, and about a third, about a third of the volume of IPOs. And it was generally thought that the Sarbanes-Oxley reforms and the reforms having to do with splitting up research analysts from the other functions of the investment banks um, really contributed to this drop-off in IPO activity, fundraising activity. And the effect that that had on the venture business was pretty profound because if you're a venture-backed company, you've got two ways to get liquidity. You can go public or you can get bought. Those are the only two things that can happen to you that are good. Those are the it's not bad things that can happen to you. But those are the two good things that can happen to you. Okay? Or you can keep going. Sometimes. But if you're going to look for liquidity as you do if you're in a venture firm and you want to liquidate your investment, you have to find a way to uh, either get bought or go public. And these things work in tandem with each other if you're an investor because if you have the threat of going public, an acquirer will look at you and say, you know, this, this company could incredibly get to be a billion dollar company, a billion and a half dollar company. We better buy them right now. If you don't credibly have that threat, then the only route for you to get liquidity is through a merger or an acquisition. And, and so these things used to work com in a complementary way from an investor perspective. But that stopped happening during this decade. The companies realized, you know, there really isn't any exit for these people for a very long time. So we're just going to sit back. We're not going to buy them because we know they're not going to go public. And we'll just see what happens. Maybe we can pick them up at a, at a low price. And, uh, and this really, uh, I think, had a generally bad effect on the venture community. So in uh, 2010, uh, thereabouts, the National Venture Capital Association and uh, some of the law firms around here, and principally my old firm, Wilson Sunstein, which did a really good job on this, I have to say. I hate it, but they did. Um, they went into Washington and started lobbying for an exception to these rules for what they call emerging growth companies. And emerging growth companies are, in the way the statute eventually turned out, companies that have less than a billion dollars in revenue. <laughs> okay, but but that is that is exactly what happened. They got um, they got the law passed by both houses, uh, bipartisan majorities on both sides, and then uh, the president signed it. And this was signed in April of 2012. It's called the Jobs Act. It doesn't have really anything to do with jobs, but it's that, that stands for Jumpstart Our Business Startups. 
That's what that stands for. And it was designed, uh, you know, to help you. And of course, if you put jobs on it, then everybody goes, yeah, how could you be against that? Um, <laughs> it's got different parts to it. Um, the, the first two are the most important, in my whole opinion, which is they took the IPO rules for emerging growth companies and they made three pretty uh, big changes. One is that they said that you can make confidential filings. Now you notice that Twitter filed their S1 confidentially with the SEC. Well, why is that such a big deal? Well, if you, in the old days, before uh, the Jobs Act, if you went and filed uh, your S1, made a registration statement with the SEC, that was just the beginning of a very, very tough process because it was all public. Everything that you filed with the SEC was public, and you have to file your financials, and you're probably wrong, you know, when you make your first filing, and the SEC is going to have comments about uh, your filing. That is all played out in the public, and you can be in a situation where if the market changes or if you miss a quarter while you're doing your, your filing, all of a sudden you can't go public and the fact that this all played out in public can be devastating to a company. I can tell you a lot of companies that went through the process of the S1, spent all that money, that on the eve of when they were going to go effective, the, the bankers would have just said, you know, there's just not the kind of demand for this stock that we thought there was going to be, so we're going to pull the offering. And all of a sudden, you have all the fees, you sort of, like we all do in life, pre-spent the money, right? You spent the offering money a little bit, and nothing. You're not going to go. And, and the world knows you're not going to go, right? So being able to, well, to do all that in confidence is a really big deal. The other thing that they did is that they are now going to allow the research analysts to have conversations with the company and give them feedback. Now, why is that such a good thing? Well, there was some abuse of the actions of the research analysts during the boom, there's no doubt about it. The research analysts effectively turned into sort of cheerleaders for the companies. And, and, and they kind of turned into sales guys for stocks when uh, you know their mathematical minds and their analytical minds knew that this was really not such a great stock. They still went out and kind of how did the stock, sold the stock. And, but the rules that they put in place to counteract that uh, were very, very onerous, very, very onerous. And they're onerous from the company's perspective because that analyst, that research analyst for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, one of these great investment banks, those people are the people who know the most about your space. They know the most about your company. They know what you should be doing. And, and as a result of these rules, you couldn't talk to them. Okay, they are, they're there as the most sophisticated buyers of your stock and all of a sudden you can't talk to them. So those two things were changed and of course they set up the, the billion dollars. Um, so that very important. The SEC ruled on how are the rules around that. Don't forget that even though Congress passes something, the SEC uh, still has the power, the right, and the obligation to write rules around how that's going to happen, action on a day-to-day -day basis. The rules recently came out on Title II, and that's really where I want to focus in here. Title II takes that thing I talked about at the beginning, the ban on general solicitations. You can't advertise, you can't tell people about it, and it gets rid of it. Think about it. It gets rid of it for a particular kind of offering, okay? So, so what can happen? Well, one of the things that can happen are these syndicates that Angel List. Oh, anybody from Angel List here? Anybody, uh, if you want to go take a look, just type in Angel List syndicates and get a very good idea about, um, about what's going to happen with those. Um, and, uh, and the basis for uh, those things started, okay? So here's the way it was, and then I'm going to show you the way it was, that it is now. There's a rule under which you can sell stock. It's called Rule 506 of the SEC. And it says that if you come up, if you do things the way we say you should, you won't be, you won't be doomed to have a public offering. See, this is a, these are all the scope of transactions by an issuer. That means sales of stock by a company that do not involve any public offerings, okay? And Rule 506 is, says, if you don't generally solicit and you don't have more than 35 non-accredited investors, you can raise any amount that you want as long as everybody else is an accredited investor. So this is the rule under which we do all the venture companies. Okay, this is the way that venture-backed companies raise, you know, $20 million, $150 million. 
because they have accredited investors. Generally, everybody they're selling to is an accredited investor. They fall into this rule. This is also how uh, TechCrunch and everybody else gets the numbers because when this offering is made, you have to go make a filing called Reg D filing at the SEC, and all of these uh, news outlets just follow those uh, filings. Those are public filings. Okay, so that's the way it was. Now they changed Section 506. They took that old rule that I just told you about, they left it in, but they made it into its own section now. They made that into uh, what they call Section B, and then they started a new one that says, okay, we're going to now have Section 5C, and in a 5C offering, you can generally solicit. You can go out on the corner with your little sign. You can go out on the corner and tell people that you're selling shares in your company, all right? What are the rules around that? Well, everybody who actually purchases, the people who actually sign the papers and write a check, each one of those people has to uh, be an accredited investor. I'll take you through, if we generally know what an accredited investor is, I'll take you through the rules in just a minute. Give me general. Um, and the issuer has to take reasonable steps to verify the accredited investor status. Now that's different. Under the old rule, if you just had somebody sign on a piece of paper and said, yeah, I'm an accredited investor, then the company has the ability to rely on that representation that that person made. In the new world of, of yes, you can make a general solicitation, uh, the company can't rely on that anymore. You have, to, um, you have to actually do something. Now in the rules, they talk about some reasonable steps. They talk about things like checking the person's W-2 or understanding their, uh, their network in a little bit more factual way than what you do just by signing on a piece of paper. Now, my partner Tom Kim, who just joined our firm, was the chief counsel for the SEC in this area. It's called corporate finance. And so he wrote these rules. And I, in the first set of slides I have for this, I laid out all the steps. And he said, oh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Why? Well, because he says it's just a factual determination. And you have to do things that are reasonable. So if you're in, a, if you're in the context where everything around you leads you to believe that the person is an accredited investor, then you can rely on that. Um, but this whole area of reasonable steps to verify is something that's going to get sorted out here over the next period of time. Okay. This is like a lawyer slide, huh? <laughs> I mean, would anybody do a slide like this except for what? The key, so I, I kind of go over the, the stuff uh, that you need to know. It's, and this will give you a sense of who an accredited investor is. A natural person who has a million dollars in net worth with a spouse, excluding the value of their primary resident, or a natural person with income exceeding $200,000 in each of the two most recent years, or a joint income of 300,000 with your spouse. Okay, so that's the bar right now for being an accredited investor. You see, it's it's high, but not super duper high. Um, most of the people who are involved in angel investing, who you know invest 50,000, 100,000, most of them are probably in this category, and in fact, they should be if they're going to be an accredited investor. But those are the rules. And if you ever want to, if you ever need to look at this again, I hope you just type in accredited investor and you'll get whatever the rules are at that time. Now, I'm going to scare you a little bit here, but don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. Tell me in advance. The SEC, when they put out the rules that became effective on September 23rd, they also put out some suggested rules. Okay, now these are suggested rules about what, what you have to do to qualify for 506C. They're not in place yet. My partner Tom says, don't know if they're ever going to be in place. A lot of people have reacted very, very negatively to these proposed rules. But these are the proposed rules that you'd have to make a filing before you start your offering, that you have to make a filing after you start your offering, you have to have written materials, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And this is, the thing to know about this is that it's not the law. It's certainly not the law right now. Whether that will really be on the law or not, we don't know. But you can see, like everything else in Washington, there's a force of action and reaction, right? You have this, this people push to have this wonderful law, in my opinion. It gets passed, and then there are reactionary forces. Who are they? 
consumer protection groups, and they met, who come out and say, look, we just don't think it, the law should be that liberal as it relates to raising money for companies. So, here's an example. Now remember, these rules went into effect September 24th. The people angel list back in March of this year went to the SEC and said, listen, we see that these rules are going to change. We have an idea that we want to get a no action letter from the SEC on. If you have an idea about an interpretation of the securities laws and you don't know whether it's right or not, your lawyer can send a letter to the SEC and lay out the facts and lay out the premises for what you want to do and request what's called a no action letter. And the SEC will take their time, they will go through all the regs, and they will write you back. It takes a while, but they will write you back. And Angel Liz was able to get a no action letter from the SEC to support the proposition that they could do these syndicates. What's a syndicate? A syndicate is a general solicitation. What it really says is, we're going to basically take this offering from an issuer, startup. Issuer equals company equals startup. We're going to Find somebody who is going to be a promoter of that, they call it a lead angel investor. That person who has social capital, somebody who's known as a, a good investor, is then going to sponsor that investment. Other people are going to invest behind that person, quote unquote, with that person. And that person is going to be able to get carried. Anybody know what carried interest is? So as a venture world, venture firms get compensated in two ways. And it's a lot. But they get compensated in two ways. One is they get a management fee that's generally equal to 2.5% of the size of their fund every year. The funds are 10 years, so it's 25% of the fund. If you have a $400 million fund, that's $100 million in management fees over 10 years. And by the way, if you have two or three funds going at the same time, you can stack them one on top of the other. Good business. It is a very good business. You also get anywhere from 20 to 30 percent carried interest. What's a carried interest? A carried interest is the securities that you bought. You get a percentage of the securities that you bought in that company, and you get to sell them for what they eventually get sold for. So if you buy stock at a dollar in a private company, you eventually end up selling it for ten dollars after the company goes public. You will get. You don't get the value of that interest, you get the actual interest, you own the stock. What's beautiful about that from the standpoint of a venture capital firm? That is capital gains. That is not ordinary. So you own that stock. You own 20, 25% of that stock, and that's in addition to your management fee. Well, that was a brief digression. I'll tell you more about venture firm economics about later. In the structure that AngelList is doing, there is no management fee but people are taking a 15% carry. And the thing that's interesting about this for me is it's going like wildfire. I mean, 300 syndicates in the last, as of last week. And this is something that started really rolling out in, uh, at the end of September, September 23rd. So, what's going to happen? We don't know. But it's very early days, and I think that it's absolutely something that bears watching. So all of you, you know, put in angel list every once in a while and see what's happening to those guys. Very innovative company. Are there issues with this? Sure there are. Uh, it's going to be hard to define what a lead investor is. All of these groupings of various investors are going to be all ad hoc. It's like a tribe that's getting together just to make one investment. Well, is that tribe going to float over and do a, a different investment in a different company? Are they going to be able to do the follow-on line in that same company? Who is the lead investor owed duty and loyalty to? Do they owe duty and loyalty to those people that are following them? Some of these lead investors are actually members of venture capital funds. Well, if I'm an investor in that venture capital fund, wait a minute. I want that person to be dedicated full time to, to building up the value of the portfolio for me. So, there are lots of comments. There are lots of issues, lots of things to think about. The good news here is we're trying something different. And it's always good. Okay, so as I said, um, <clears throat> the real question for me, it's kind of ironic that the venture firms, the National Venture Capital Association, are the people who really promoted this, because it's not clear what it's going to do to the sort of lower end of the venture business. The venture business is dominated 
by what they call the top four top. If you've been able to beat the S&P 500 by 400 basis points, four, four percentage points of returns over the course of 10 years, you can get all the money in the world. People will come after you. It's very, very hard to do to beat the box, to beat the S&P. You can do it in venture, but there are very few firms that actually do it, the top four top. What's going to happen to the people in the bottom half? What's going to happen to the people in the, in the bottom four top? Well, I think what's going to happen is it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get into deals because more and more deals are going to be funded at a very early stage as a result of this. Okay? There's also, I would say, there are also a lot of legal issues. We've been thinking about this a lot in our law firm. We don't know. I mean, we know what the setting is, and one of the reasons we're very happy that Tom has joined us is that he can give us some legal structure around this. But I think as you guys think about this and you start contemplating, okay, how do I position my company for taking advantage of this change in the rules, it's really good to have um, some lawyer involved. And let me do a little bit of a commercial for not our firm, but lawyers generally. We live in a really great place, let me tell you why. Oh, you can't see that, it's too bad. Can you see all those dots? Those are all law firms in the valley. <laughs> If you want to send me an email, I can send you a copy of this. I know a lot of you come up over your bed or something. <laughs> but there are, if you look at the number here, there are uh, a lot. <laughs> 60? 60 of the top 100 law firms in the United States are located right here. When I started, there were like three guys. And now there are these amazing numbers. What's good about this for you? What's good about this for you is that every one of these firms has a startup friendly program. What does that mean? They will defer their fees. They will charge you lower rates and they will defer their fees until you get some financing. We'll do it. Um, just about everybody will do it. You have to be formal before you step into the program, but you know, it's, it's, it's a really good thing and a really good advantage that we have here in the Valley is that you shouldn't think that because you're in a startup, nobody at a big law firm is going to be interested in working with you. The fact is, everybody at these big firms is interested in working with you because that's where the big companies come from. You know, that's where the big companies come from. Every single law firm has the same model. We start with the startups when they're small, you try to keep them as they grow to mid-sized companies, and then you stay around for the IPO, you stay around for the big merger and acquisition transaction. That's, that's how you do it. You, know, you need to have big companies work with too, that's the economic support. But um, every one of them will work with you and every one of them will help you be successful. So so uh, even if you don't want to use clearly the best law firms in the world. You know, you, there's no reason for not getting really good legal counsel about this stuff because you can get it basically at a very, very low level. Okay? So, with that, I'm going to pause. I want to wish you all a lot of success, which I'm sure you're going to have. And I want to take some questions about some of these other things that people want to ask about. We talk about master, someone wanted to talk about um, venture and negotiating venture terms. Let me just tell you about the venture capital process. Here's what you need to remember. Scorpions in a bottle. Okay? Scorpions in a bottle. That's a venture capital firm. Nobody, no matter what they tell you, nobody can green light or approve your investment on their own. Everybody has to socialize an investment with their partners. I don't care whether it's Michael Moore, it's not Valentine's name. Everybody has to take it to the partners. And the process by which they do that is like this. Say you want to make an investment. Somebody comes in, they pitch you, they look really good, you think, boy, this would be great. You get to know them, you do diligence on the founders, you find out they're really good people. You start developing some conviction, that's the word. You start developing some conviction around this investment. Okay? You do your own diligence, you understand the market space. That's why venture capitalists tend to specialize in very niche kind of areas because they know all the players in that area. They can find out whether this is a real company very quickly. Now. So you socialize it, you think to yourself, yeah, I kind of like these guys. If they come back twice, you've done a lot of work. You start going around to your partners. You start visiting them in their offices when they're in a good mood. And you say, I found this company. I'm kind of excited about it. Let me tell you about it. You socialize the investment. Okay. Then your partners, 
assuming that they're disposed to you at that time, you haven't done something really stupid in the last six months or so, or you just had a big hot investment, they may be favorable to you. They say, okay, hey, bring them on in. Come on, bring them on in. And then you go and you appear before all of the partners in the venture firm. And that's a very difficult meeting. It's an extremely difficult meeting if you don't have any metrics. If you don't have anything to say other than I have this great idea. If you have a great idea, that's great, it's just a great idea. It's in the abstract. If you have metrics, if you have any metric, anything that's going up and to the right, whether it's views, dollars, people who walk by your offices every morning, anything that's going up and to the right is a metric. And it's really important to have some metrics. So then you leave, and then the, the heavy fighting begins within the venture firm about allocations. Every firm is limited in its capital. Nobody has unlimited capital. Everybody wants to put it to work, but everybody is a human being. Everybody's got the same kinds of um, concerns. Uh, do I really like my partner? Do I really not like my partner? He took my parking place two months ago. He's never going to get another deal done in this firm. And people bring, these are smart people, they all bring really powerful, logical minds to bear on this. And either positively or negatively, it is human nature. It's just a, a study, it's a microcosm of human nature, okay? People go back and forth, they make a decision. Are we gonna invest in this company or not? The answer is yes, then all of a sudden, the leverage in your negotiation has changed. Because now, the entrepreneur has gone from please, 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 just invest in my company, to your venture capitalist now has the order. Your venture capitalist has been empowered by his or her partners to make that investment. Now, from the standpoint of venture capitalists, they better down well for this demo, right? Because when you get that ticket that says, hi, you can go invest $5 million or $6 million, you don't want to lose that ticket. You want to make that investment. You want to put that money to work. And so, once somebody's put a term sheet down in front of you, you actually have some money. Yeah. Is there a set formula that a lot of venture capitalists are looking at to, um, I, I realize the fact that you're saying they need to have a conversation with other partners, right. but is there a certain criteria that makes that conversation go faster? Sure. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's the quality of the market, it's the quality of people, and it's the quality of the technology. I would, and I've heard that why the quality of the market? Because if a raising market, a rising market, a trend, whatever you want to call it, it makes up for a lot of bad behavior. If things are, if the market is going up, you, you can mess up and you will mess up as an entrepreneur. You will do things totally wrong. You will, you will. But if the market is going, well, take an example, security right now, you know, bots, whatever you want to call it. There's sort of an unlimited demand for a very, very good solution in that space, right? Um, it's like CAD used to be. You know, they're, they're, it's a really, a really good market, okay? So it's forgiving. So you want to have a forgiving market. And then you want to have the best people you can. Are you going to have to trade some in and out over the course of the company? Yes, you are. But you want to start with the best team you possibly can. And then the technology. What's the technology, technological solution that's supposed to address this market need? Okay? So those are, those three things just keep going over and over and over again. The other thing that people talk about is risk reduction. Okay? What are the risk reduction points for this company? And can we get there on the kind of money that they want to invest, that they want us to invest in? It? So when you talk, start talking, have a rational conversation about how much money we're raising as a company, but really the question is, what am I buying for this money? So what risk reduction points are you guys going to hit? as a result of us putting in $3 million, $4 million, $5 million, right? It's, what, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna prove out the market, we're gonna get the technology done, and by that I mean, we're gonna, our, our software, whatever it is, is gonna have the following six pieces of functionality. You're basically making a promise to the investors that for this amount of money invested in the company, you're gonna achieve X. Why is that important? Because it's really important when you go around B. Because you want to be able to say to the next fine investor, we did what we said we were going to do. We said that for $1.8 million, $2 million, $4 million, we would get the following risk. All company growth is, is risk reduction, right? We would get the following risk out of the company, and we did that. That's an extremely powerful argument for a series B round. In fact, it's the only one that really works. 
But just back to your point, yes, you can negotiate some of these things, participating, preferred, all the other things that you hear about. By the way, uh, there's a book that you're all welcome to just email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll send you a link, it's 17 max. It was put out by the, um, the predecessor to the National Venture Capital Association in the late 80s. I've been giving it to people since the late 80s. It's a really good book about, uh, it's called The Layman's Guide to Venture Capital Financing. And it just goes through all the terms, all the things that you can negotiate. And uh, it kind of lays them out in the music to read. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, good enough for that long time. Okay, enough of that. So, uh, there was a question about social. Yeah. So the risks in sharing economy? Risk in the sharing economy. Well, <coughs> someone called Lisa Gansky has a book called Mesh, and it's all about sharing companies. Um, I think it's absolutely here to stay, and when you think about it, it's cost reduction. It's making use of resources that are otherwise unused in society, right? It's, it's this whole concept of why do you need the exclusive use of X, car, house, whatever you want to do, when in fact you're only using it 20% of the time? Why can't we as a society put that to productive use the other 80% of the time? And how do we lower the barriers to making that happen? Well, the internet, you know, John Gore had this famous quote, the internet, maybe it's underhyped. It's not overhyped, it's underhyped. And I think we're still in the middle of all that. We're still in the middle of the internet revolution. It's not, it's not even close to being over. And what the sharing economy comes out of the fact that people can do these transactions and take care of these and use these underutilized resources. Right? I mean, even now, like I don't own a shovel, but if I ever need a shovel, I can get a shovel. It's like a text away. I, I got five friends, they all got shovels. I don't know why they bought them. But I get it. You know? And and send send with me. Someone needs a drum machine, I have a drum machine. Okay, I'll let me use drum machine. So then you've got all the commercial applications going on that. I just think, I think that's an area that, again, is kind of underhyped. I think, you know, just look at everything that's happened, Airbnb. Are there issues around it? Yes, of course. But, you know, people don't take care of the thing that they're using. Um, people violate laws. You saw today somebody subpoenaed Airbnb's record is the one that, you know, the forces of reaction are out there. In their case, the Hotel Owners Association. Right? There's always going to be action and reaction. There's always going to be maps going to wreck at some point. Okay? That's just going to play out over and over and over again. But we should never let that force of reaction uh, stand in the way. Because ultimately, it's temporary. Ultimately, it's temporary. It may not seem like it to you. And my partner, David Marshall, always uses the phrase, the clinically relevant time period. Right? It's the time period before you're dead. So it may not work out in the time in the clinically relevant time here, but eventually it will work. Did that answer your question? <clears throat> yes. I, I'm not sure if, if that question pertained to the sharing economy you were just talking about or intellectual property aspects, that kind of sharing. Yeah, I was talking not about intellectual right. property aspects. I understand. Uh, do you want me to speak for one minute on intellectual property generally? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Smart man. Um, uh, well, here's what I think about that. Intellectual property is, uh, in many ways, uh, a good thing because it, the fundamental premise of it is that we should give people exclusive rights. In fact, what it says in the Constitution, exclusive rights for a limited period of time so that they will be able to um, get the benefit of the ideas, that's in patents, and the works of authorship, that's in copyright, that they come up with. So is that a fundamentally good idea? Yes, it's a fundamentally good idea. Um, has been since you know, the 1700s in the Statue of Anne. The problem is that the people who make margin from the exploitation of either inventions or their works, what they do, well, they, they do what everybody else would do. They invest in new laws to make their um, rights more exclusive, for a longer period of time, with water applicability, et cetera. And in my opinion, we're, we're way over on that end of the curve in terms of the, the power and the scope of the rights that are out there right now. Thank goodness, through the efforts of many, many people, uh, that pendulum is swinging back. 
But, um, you know, I don't think it's there yet. But that, that's something we'll play out over the next 10 years or so. Is that consistent with your beliefs? Somewhat. Somewhat. Depends you like the part where I liked it. Depends on which side of the pendulum you hang your hat. Yeah. I'm sorry? Depends on which side of the pendulum you hang your hat. Yeah. Well, but the, 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 the point is that, that if you get so far, so protective, you can actually start to have a marginal decrease in the innovation because people can't act to suffocate. That's what I believe. And I believe if you look at patents, we certainly got to that point. If you look at copyrights, I think that's changing. But um, I, I, I'm very much of the group that says we need reform in all of those areas. Uh, I, I'm still in favor of the fundamental statutes, but I think they all need to be reformed. Yeah? What is the take of software patents? Well, it's basically the same. And here's the thing that people need to understand. We have a unitary patent system in the United States. So there's only one patent law, and it's the same law for biotechnology as it is for software, as it is for chip design. It's all the same patent law. And the difficulty that we have is that the measure of damages is based on the entire product. So a molecule is one entire product. Okay. But a, a newly designed capacitor, the measure of damages in, 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 a, in a patent suit over that capacitor is the entire product that it's in. So the effect on the IT industry versus the biotechnology industry and the pharmaceutical industry of, of patent reform, so-called patent reform, is very, very different. Very, very different effects, even though we only have one law. So what happened two years ago when we were going to have a big reform of the patent laws? The biotech guys and the big pharma guys came out and said, uh-uh. We are generally plaintiffs in those cases because we own those rights. We're not defending it. The IT guys said, wait, we're getting sued left and right. We're down in the Eastern District of Florida, the foods are uh, Texas, the food's not good down there. We just don't want to be defended down there anymore. And we think it's very, very unfair how, how we're being held up by all these patent trolls, so-called non-practicing entities, et cetera. It was a big you know, debate that went on in DC. And I, my view is that the IT, IT industry largely did not prevail. So do you think that they will be banned? Like, can you, can you I, I don't think they will be, no. No, I don't think that you're going to see that in the United States. And certainly this, the Supreme Court as it stands right now, will not do it. And by the way, this is uh, so embarrassing. We have a really bad uh, structure, and again, for the way we treat patent cases in the United States. Until 1983, because this is so esoteric, there was a, um, before 1983, if you had a patent case in the United States, it was first term in a district court, like it was a federal district court in San Jose, right? And if you didn't like the result there, you could take it to the circuit court, which was the Ninth Circuit Court, which was up in San Francisco. They got all the appeals of the patent cases. And generally, these circuit courts, they were kind of hostile to patents. They didn't like them. The phrase used to be, the only valid patent is a patent that hasn't been litigated yet. So the, these courts are not particularly favorable to patents because the judges didn't understand the technology and they're kind of against monopoly. Okay? In 1983, we started a new federal court called the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is a court that sits in D.C. and hears all the appeals from patent cases no matter where they're brought up in the United States. And it's staffed by, that's what, patent lawyers. And are they for patent? You betcha. So called patent that the Supreme Court is still handle all the cases at the higher level, the highest level, kind of had to pull them back over the course of the last two or three years. But that that reform, quote unquote, which was promoted by Senator Hatch, Senator Leahy, members of the Judiciary Committee, I think was really, really not a good thing to do. And um, it's just part of the picture, which is uh, is where we are now, which is where the, the laws are very, very strong. Yeah. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you will sign an NDA. So the question was, 
you know, how do you protect yourself when you're out fishing? Um, the answer is, you don't tell the secrets off. You say, here's the functionality, here's sort of the step functions, and they say, gee, that, that's magic. You know? yeah. And they say, well, how do you do that? And you say, no, 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 not right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and seriously, it's like that. You have to do it. Yeah, well, have you seen that, uh, that animation that's on about uh, Tesla, the yeah. other Tesla? Pitching to the VCs about his idea of wirelessly recharging cell phones. It's a great thing. It's on YouTube. It's an animation. And it's just like that. Tesla comes in, he's going to tell everybody about his invention. And the VCs bring in somebody and says, oh, This is Tom. He's an ERR. He's going to start a company in your space. Is that okay if he listens to you? Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that, I wouldn't be too worried about that because these are extremely busy people and they kind of don't have time to be on. Uh, Doing that, but um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't drill all the way down. Should you be getting to the role that you're going to 
fulfill and how much should I be making to allow them to fulfill. What's particularly dangerous is when somebody's around at the very beginning, the very formation of the company, and then they sort of stop and they go off and they do something else. And you think, oh, that Bob, he was involved here a little bit. He helped us with our debt, but now Bob doesn't seem to be around anymore. All it will take to get Bob back is for you to have a little bit of success. Okay? And then Bob will come out of the world. You know, we call this the sort of disappearing founder. <laughs> All of a sudden Bob's back and says, yeah, no, I was, that was me. I did the dad. You guys told me I was going to get a third company. I mean, I've seen this play out so many times. And, and I would make a bigger point. And my partner, John Howard, the venture firm, used to say this all the time. But it's just about hygiene for companies. You have to keep your stock agreements straight. You have to keep your, um, your non disclosure agreements straight. You have to keep all this little housekeeping stuff in order. Why? Because at some point, when you least expect it, somebody's going to come along and say, I want to buy you. And if that stuff is not together, then all of a sudden you've become, you've become a very, very painful time. Because there was an opportunity there that you can't take care of because Bob came out of the woodwork again. And Bob wants a third. So when would be a good time to do that? Is that something after we get funding or? No, no. Like the moment we move Yes. So it should be just a piece of paper or just what will be the cover to? Yeah, it should be a piece of paper. It should be an understanding that's written down. In the place where they have friends, yeah. Well, that's why they don't. Because there's an implicit, you don't trust me. Or, you know, we're not that, we don't have that kind of relationship. We're friends, you know, 50-50. Yeah, it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, so you just, you have, and people who I know who have been through seven, eight, nine, ten startups, that's the first thing they do. And it just, get it straight, get it done, get it out. It's like a prenup. Okay. And, and just, just to be clear, everybody has a prenup. How many people are married? You have a prenup whether you like it or not. You have the one that the state gives you. Okay. So you just have a, you have a, you have a choice. Am I going to take the one the state gives me or do I have my own? And that's exactly what it is in the, if you don't want to go fight out an equitable case with your co-founders later on about who gets what, then the best thing you can do for yourself is to understand and sit down. And sit down with a third person, sit down with a lawyer, say what's typical. You know, and just kind of walk through it. Do you recommend individual to work? I do, because then you've got a neutral person who's there. It's unlikely that a fight's going to break out. You know, there'll be a fire extinguisher there if it does. These good things. <coughs> Yes. Is it possible to get, I mean, that's what I came here for, is it possible to get some kind of a primer on, let's say I'm an engineer, I have a couple of co-founders, and we are getting to the point where the VC is willing to lend us money. What other things we have to look out for? I mean, there's so many different things. There's, there's stock options, stock option plans, there's convertible notes, there's founder, and there's founder options, there's, there's this whole industry out there of terms that engineers don't know about. Yeah. So how do we educate ourselves on this stuff so we can sure. negotiate? Uh, the good news is that you're in a world where everybody knows this. First of all, you can call me out. Second of all, um, there's a thing called uh, NBCA.com, National Venture Capital Association. They have a, a tab called Resources on the website that has all the documents that everybody uses right there. So, and you can take a look at that book that I suggested that people look at. And it's all laid out right there, too. There are about three or four books that different lawyers around here have written. People talk about it there. So it's really just a process of education. Um, I talked tonight about this general solicitation rule because I think that is really a big change. But the fact is that most, 98% of the deals that have been done over the last 30 years all kind of look the same. Why? Why, why do we do that? Why do we have plan vanilla financing? Why? Because we want the company to focus on the product, not on the financing. I mean, we, the, one of the great things about this, and I was in the right hand of business, one of the great things about where we live is that people aren't really trying to, you know,
screw the other guy and get that last little bit, which is unfortunately somewhat characteristic of their opinions. And why is that? Because the documents are just standard for the most part. You know, yeah, you can, you can do this, you know, 3x versus 2x. There's little, little things you can nibble around the edges, but fundamentally, the standard is the standard. And I'll tell you where it comes from. The original Silicon Valley venture investors were about people being in the same boat and rowing the same way, okay? The founders put up their technology and their sweat. The investors put up their money and their expertise and their connections, okay? And other than that, other than the fact that the um, venture investors generally will get a preferred stock, which means they get their money back first, everything else really ought to be kind of even. I mean, the standard model for Adobe, when it was founded, for Silicon Graphics, 20 other companies is, the investors get 40%, the founders get 40%, and we put 20% of the pool for the employees. That has just played itself out over and over. And why? Because it works, right? Because the, the, the whole premise of this place is the money doesn't matter really. You know, certainly the the idea, the the, uh, the perspective that the entrepreneur brings to the marketplace and, and, and the channel, that is way as important as capital. And you can't really balance those, so let's just call it even the make a pump. And if we all do that and stick to that, we'll be fine. Do those agreements change once you uh, start raising the money? Say the founders have 150 or I don't know, 40, 40, or something like that. But then that's all part of the negotiation process, too. Yeah, it's all implicit in the notion of valuation. Which, by the way, the valuation that you hear for a company that's a venture-backed company has nothing to do with the real value of that company. It's just er 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 arithmetic, arithmetic, okay? It's just, we're gonna buy 20% of this company for $5 million, that means the rest of it is one number. And it, it's just that calculation. So when somebody says we raise money at $150 million valuation, you couldn't take all the stock in that company and go down the corner and sell for $150 million. You could. So that's not the value of the company. What it is is it says it's just the it's the product, the arithmetic product of we're going to buy ten percent of the company for ten million dollars. Therefore, it comes worth hundred million dollars. Is anybody going to spend hundred million dollars in this company? No. But somebody will buy ten percent of the company for ten million dollars. Okay. You're only selling ten percent. Where are you going to have on, on paper with your founder? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, maybe I should make that clear. Uh, just like in the film of producers, you can only have 100%. So what typically happens is you go through rounds of financing. You're selling more and more stock in the company in order to raise that money. Um, and therefore, your percentage interest is coming down for the most part because of the entrepreneurs generally don't have money to put stuff in. Now, there are horror stories. When Silicon Graphics, Silicon Graphics took so long to become a successful company, and so much investment money went in that the founders, including Jim Clark, the famous Jim Clark, ended up with a very, very small percentage of the company simply because they had taken so long. Okay. And then there are other, you know, there are other things like Google and stuff where you get this kind of a rocket ship, and the founders end up with a big, big chunk of the company. Why? Because they didn't have to go through a bunch of rounds of things. They started out with a big chunk, and it never went down. So I wish you all a lot of success. Thanks for coming on.